Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about public goods. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the Total Review Booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. Now this is our market failures unit and public goods result in a specific type of market failure. And in order to learn what public goods are, first we have to understand what rival versus non-rival goods are. A rival good is a good that gets used up as it is consumed. That means as one person uses it, there's less available for future consumers. An example of a rival good is a donut. If one person consumes the donut, there is one less donut for future consumers. Non-rival goods, on the other hand, are goods that are not diminished in quantity as a result of some consumers purchasing or using the product. That means countless consumers can consume the product at the same time. An example of a non-rival good is streaming music services. When I listen to my Spotify playlist, there isn't less music for you to listen to at the exact same time. Now because non-rival goods have shared consumption and you can have countless people enjoying the good at the exact same time, the marginal cost of production for non-rival goods is going to be zero. So if we draw a demand curve with marginal revenue below, this would be for a monopoly or monopolistically competitive firm. If they produce a non-rival good, then the cost of production will be along the x-axis there. That is where the marginal cost is zero. This firm will produce where MR equals MC and price at the demand curve above. That is the unregulated price and quantity for this firm. But the socially optimal price and quantity is at PS and QS there. And since this firm will not choose to produce the socially optimal quantity, we have this triangle of deadweight loss. And that deadweight loss is so big because this good is non-rival. Next, we're going to talk about excludable versus non-excludable goods. An excludable good is a good where it's possible or practical to prevent people from enjoying the good if they haven't paid for it. A concert that is held in a stadium is an excludable good. Only people who purchase the tickets can get into that concert. Non-excludable goods, on the other hand, are goods which can be enjoyed without paying for them. An example of a non-excludable good would be a public fireworks display. Since those fireworks are launched into the air, anybody who is nearby with a view of the sky can see and enjoy the fireworks without paying for them. And that's because public fireworks displays are non-excludable. Now the problem with non-excludable goods is they suffer from the free rider problem. Free riders are people who enjoy the benefits of a good without paying for them. And non-excludable goods have a free rider problem. And the reason free riders are a problem is because it causes goods to be underproduced. There is little incentive for people to buy the product when they can enjoy it without paying for it. And as a result, the demand for this product will be abnormally low and that demand will be much lower than the marginal social benefit of the product. If we were to graph it out, we've got our marginal social benefit there. Our marginal social cost is the supply curve as well, but our demand is much lower than the marginal social benefit. And so the free market equilibrium quantity labeled QE will be much lower than the socially optimal quantity labeled QS. And we're going to have that triangle of deadweight loss as a result of underproducing this product. And if enjoying this good without paying for it is so easy, it's actually possible that there could be no demand at all. And if there's no demand at all, that means the market will produce zero units of output. And we would actually have that giant triangle of deadweight loss as a result of having no units produced. Now we're going to look at the ideas of rival versus non-rival and excludable versus non-excludable to classify goods into four different categories. First, we have our private goods. Private goods are both rival and excludable. That means using the good uses it up and it's possible and practical to prevent people from enjoying the product without paying for it. Your wireless phone is both rival and excludable. When you have your phone, there's one less for somebody else and you can't get that phone until you've paid for it. A bean burrito from my favorite restaurant is also going to be a private good. If I eat the bean burrito, there's one less for somebody else and the restaurant won't give me the burrito unless I paid for it. Next, we have natural monopoly goods, sometimes called club goods. These are goods that are non-rival and excludable. The marginal cost of production for these goods is zero, but the fact that they are excludable means we're going to have a natural monopoly. Video streaming services are both non-rival and excludable, and internet service providers are also non-rival and excludable. And while neither of these may be true monopolies, the natural monopoly graph with a very low marginal cost is what this graph will look like. Third, we have our public resources. Public resources are both rival and non-excludable. That means using the resource is going to use it up, but it's impossible or impractical to prevent people from using the good. Fish in our ocean are both rival 
and non-excludable. As fishermen catch fish, there is less fish for future generations. And it's very difficult to actually prevent people from fishing in the oceans. Also, lumber in our forests is both rival and non-excludable. And as a result, it's a public resource. Public resources can fall victim to the tragedy of the commons. And as a result, governments usually impose regulations in an attempt to make those resources excludable. And that can help these resources from being overexploited and prevent the tragedy of the commons. Finally, we have the public goods. And these are the goods that this video is supposed to be all about. And this is the type of good that shows up most on the AP microeconomics exam. Public goods are both non-rival and non-excludable. That means public goods are going to suffer from the free rider problem and marginal cost of production will be zero. An example of a public good is national defense. When I feel protected from foreign invaders by our military, that doesn't make my neighbor feel less protected. At the same time, it's not possible for people in the country to be protected who want to pay for it while not protecting those who don't. So we all pay taxes and the government pays for the national defense, whether we want to or not. Tsunami warning sirens are also an example of a public good. They are both non-rival and non-excludable. When one person hears the siren, there isn't less siren for somebody else to hear, and it's not possible for us to prevent people who didn't pay for the sirens from hearing them. So when it comes to public goods, we usually have a public provision. That means that the government is paying for the product and providing it for everyone. Because we know the free market is going to fail to produce the socially optimal quantity, so the government might be able to create a more efficient outcome. And there you have it. That's what you need to know about rival versus non-rival, excludable versus non-excludable, and most importantly, public goods. If you're ready to practice this, head over to ReviewEcon.com and practice the good sorting game. And if you still need more help after that, pick up the Total Review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see you all next time.